Well, I'm glad you could all come this evening. Uh, my name is Gay Allison, and I am the program coordinator for the National Science Foundation EPSCOR program that's here in Montana. And for those of you who are like me, who don't understand acronyms, or they just fly by because you hear dozens of them every single day, EPSCOR stands for Experimental Program to Stimulate Competitive Research. And this is congressional money that's federally mandated to states that are underfunded in the sciences, such as Montana. So we compete competitively with other states that are in our same situation for grant funding. And we have been successful since 1980 in getting awards for this kind of funding to bring infrastructure building to our state in the sciences. And right now we're finishing a three-year grant. It ends in July. And it's uh, $4.5 million from NSF. But NSF, as a federal agency, requires that we have match money or buy-in from our state in some way. So we compete again for a second match from the state of Montana. So NSF promises us $2 for every dollar we can get from the state. And we've been fully matched by the state of Montana now since 1998. So that says that our legislature is finally hearing that science and education and building those things here in our state are really, really important. Um, and let me give you a couple of statistics that I ran down today since our grant is ending. At this point, we have funded 15 new faculty hires, 39 PhD graduate students, over 200 undergraduate students. And because we are also involved with the state, we do outreach. And one of those areas is SBIR, which stands for, that's another acronym, Small Business Innovative Research. And this allows small companies to get funding from us in a competitive way. And so we've given $150,000 to that for, I think, 15 different companies in the, in the state to build and grow. And they um, are doing pretty well, I think, at this point. Um, one of the other programs that we run, and we run 14 of them right now, uh, is the Science Within Society Lecture Series. And we created this series so that we could provide the public with a place to talk about science and the arts. And the, my boss, who wrote this grant, is a scientist. And I come from the liberal arts side. So we've had many discussions about why this is important. You need both in order to live your life successfully. And so that's why we've brought this program here for you. And we've been running this program for about four years. And our program coordinator, who some of you may have been familiar with, her name was Holly Truitt. And she's gone on to graduate school. She's here on campus in the environmental studies program. And I have the delightful pleasure of introducing our new program coordinator, Deb Fosnott. Come on up, Deb. She is fantastic. She's taken over this program and a summer diversity program that has 12 students here from around the country. And it's great. It's like I didn't lose a step. And so Deb's going to introduce our guest. Thank you. Thank you, Gay. Hello and welcome. I'm Deb Fosnott, and it's my pleasure to introduce our guest tonight. But I would like to take a moment and thank everyone for coming this evening. It makes our science and lecture series very valuable to have you here. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Richard Manning, our local author and guest speaker this evening. Um, his, tonight's presentation that Dick's prepared for us is um, excuse me, science must re reinvent agriculture. What a captivating topic that will be. Richard Manning is the author of seven books, with an eighth currently in publication with the Rockefeller Foundation. The titles of his books include Against the Grain, Food's Frontier, 
Inside Passage, One Round River, Grassland, the History, Biology, Politics, and Promise of the American Plains, A Good House, and Last Stand, Logging, Journalism, A Case for Humility. As a freelance writer, Richard Manning has also had several essays and articles featured in numerous national publications, including Harper's, Wired, The Los Angeles Times, The New York Times, Audubon, Outside, High Country, High Country News, and others. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dick Manning. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. This is the point where I'm supposed to stand here and tell a few cheap jokes, but I'm not going to tonight. Um, because we had about 10,000 years to cover of human history, and so I probably should get right to it. There will be a test at the end. Um, I, I'm really excited about talking about the idea of science and society. It's not an irrelevant topic to me at all. In fact, that's the one question that I've considered more than any other for the last 20 years. I'm not a scientist, I'm a journalist. Um, uh, sort of a parasite on scientists, a, bo a bottom feeder, as it were. <laughs> what I do is chase scientists around and try to find out what they know and try to communicate it to the rest of the world. I, I got into this habit about 15 years ago when I was working at the Missoulian as a reporter, and I was the environmental reporter there. And I was covering politics, straightforward politics, and I was becoming increasingly frustrated with covering politics, so I did something that almost no reporter before or since has done. It, most papers. I, I looked at scientists, or I started finding scientists to find out what they had to say about these issues. And I finally find, found I was getting some satisfaction, some answers to the issues that were plaguing us. And this, of course, got me in trouble. But it didn't stop me from asking questions. And I've been doing so ever since. And I finally concluded that one of the problems, whether probably the biggest problem in our society is that we've relegated scientists to a subculture. They are separate. They might as well be in Antarctica for all the mainstream culture pays attention to them. And that's not gotten better in the last 20 years. That's gotten worse. And it's too bad because too often we think of science as a body of knowledge, and it's not. Science is a habit of mind. And we need that habit of mind. It's a habit of asking questions and then questioning the answers. It's a habit of rejecting dogma. And we don't need a better example right now than the Iraq war to tell us where not rejecting dogma can get us. We need scientists. But the more I followed scientists as well, the more I learned something really important from them, a sense of humility. Because the more they ask questions, the more they understand that the complexity of the natural world is beyond them. And we'll never really get it all. It's bigger than we are. It's bigger than our brains. And we also need that sense of humility now as we go forth and try to deal with the complexity of the world and the problems that face us. Some general approaches to science, but specifically, I was an environmental writer and still am. The more I wrote about environment, the more I kept coming back to a single set of questions, which is my topic tonight, agriculture. Now granted, that's a really lousy career move to say you're going to write about agriculture, because there's nothing really that bores editors more, especially East Coast editors, than you call them up and say, I'm going to write about farming. <laughs> but I couldn't really avoid it, bad career move aside. Because I was an environmental writer, and the more I wrote about the environment, the more I came to understand that all of our problems are rooted in agriculture in some fashion. I don't mean just the way we farm today. I mean 10,000 years. And I wrote a, I've written a book that really argues that humanity took a wrong turn 10,000 years ago, and it's our job now to correct that. That's what I mean by reinventing agriculture. We're aware of the environmental problems of agriculture, sort of. We think of them in terms of pesticides, and that's a problem, but it's not the biggest one. In fact, if you ask me to cite the biggest problem, 
modern agriculture, I'd cite nitrogen pollution. In the last 30 years, we have doubled the amount of nitrogen in play. And human beings now contribute more nitrogen to, this, to the planetary cycles than the planet does itself. That's really important. But even that understates the level of problems. Nitrogen is relatively recent, nitrogen fertilizers. And as I said, these problems go 10,000 years. Let me cut to the chase for right off here and say that, in fact, the, the, the scientist Stuart Pym has put together a wonderful book, it's P-I-M-M, -M, a wonderful book accounting for humanity's impact on the Earth. And he did two separate accountings. The scientists sat down kind of back of the envelope calculations. And what they're trying to understand is primary productivity. In other words, all energy on the Earth comes from the sun. There is no other source. So the calculation is, how much of that energy do we humans use? The answer is, from two separate calculations, 40%. Okay. So a single species is accounting for 40% of all there is. A single species of the millions extant. That explains the trouble we're in right now. Almost all of that, almost all of that is resulting from agriculture. But it's more than just resource depletion, because as we understand these issues, we come to understand that agriculture, as been, it's been practiced for 10,000 years, is the engine of population growth. The very thing that drives population growth. And that's our biggest problem. I need to make that case. And to make it, I'll go back to 10,000 years to domestication. Because we're starting to understand what happened 10,000 years ago when humanity made that decision to begin farming. Note, I'm talking about agriculture. I'm not talking about food. They're very different things. And I'll start drawing that distinction out as we go. But we need to understand that we humans existed for probably 200,000 years before agriculture came along. And we obviously ate food, right? We survived. But there was a new experiment, and that experiment was based in domestication. We domesticated plants and animals. And it occurred probably five, six, seven different places on the planet simultaneously, or close to simultaneously, but certainly independently. In other words, there was no single person who thought of agriculture. It just started of its own almost spontaneously. We can make the case that it was an evolutionary development. And in fact, it's a complex case, and I won't make it tonight, but we can make the case that it's equally correct to say plants and animals domesticated us as it is to say we domesticated plants and animals. A coalition of species arose. We know this is true from, from, the, from the evidence that we can find in cities, ancient cities of 10,000 years ago, because all of a sudden the plants change shape. And then we understand domestication had occurred because it was our selection pressure that caused that to change. But animals changed shape at the same time. That was the re that's the evidence of domestication. But there's also other interesting bits of evidence. Another is, in cities or um, settlements existed before agriculture. But we know that settlements were agricultural by the shape of the houses. And in all those places in the world where domestication happened, we suddenly see a variation in house size. There'll be one big house and a lot of little houses and there'll be a granary connected to that big house. That occurred almost every place. What that tells us was there's a differential in wealth. Suddenly, there were people who were wealthy. There's a reason for that, because before that, we couldn't store food. And that was the only way we had energy. But with the domestication of grains, and all of agriculture is based in grain, the domestication of grains, we all of a sudden had the ability to store food. And that created wealth. It, at the same time, conversely, created poverty. Because if you have a differential, you can have a hierarchy, and you can have some people exploit other people because those people have wealth. Something else happened, though, and this is equally as important. Those species that we domesticated were annual grasses, okay? corn, wheat, and rice. It's the basis of human civilization. 
It drove domestication to begin with, with some few very interesting exceptions. Those have largely faded away. It is all of human nutrition to this day. Today, humanity gathers two-thirds of its nutrition from corn, wheat, and rice, those three plants. They share something in common besides being grasses. They're annual grasses. Okay, that means they die every year. And it's, a, it's a minority strategy in the plant world to be an annual. Most plants are perennials. And to survive as an annual, you have to invest all your energy in seed, okay? not in stems and roots and all those things that go as an, into an infrastructure of a stable plant. But in, all the energy goes in seed. That's why we like them so much, because we can capture that energy from that seed. Such plants, such a strategy, evolved on its own in nature to take advantage of a certain situation. They have a role in nature. That situation is catastrophe. Okay, so when there's a volcano, when there's a fire, when there's a flood, those specialized annual grasses move in, colonize that spot, and begin succession and fade away rather quickly so more stable plant communities begin to establish themselves. That is the root of our problems, okay, right there. Because to do farming, to farm, we have to imitate that catastrophe. We have to go in every year for those annual plants and wipe out all of biodiversity, take it to zero. That's a farmer's job, to make biodiversity zero, to allow that single plant to grow. It takes a lot of energy to do that. At the same time, it says the plant, that those stable communities cannot build up the infrastructure of a community, which is soil, which is diversity, which allows plants to survive together. In fact, the annuals spend down that natural capital that a normal community builds. There's a measure of this. If you go to Iowa today, and if you can find a stretch of native prairie, and that's less than 1% of Iowa is still in its native habitat, we'd be marching in the streets if Montana had less than 1% of its native habitat left. If you can find that spot, and you'll walk down into the adjacent cornfield, you will literally walk down, and there will be a cornfield adjacent, I guarantee it. Okay? You'll walk down about six feet. What that is is a measure of the depletion of the topsoil that had to occur with farming. What that meant from the very beginning, from day one, is that farming constantly had to have new land because it depleted land. Okay. This is especially true of wheat agriculture. So forget about rice for a second. It's got kind of separate rules. It's especially true of wheat agriculture, which began in Iraq. Iraq today has about 70% of its landscape depleted by farming. It's useless land. So does Afghanistan. There's a reason we're in those countries. There's a reason they are basket cases, because their soils were depleted. About 6,000 years ago, give or take, a group of people gathered on the shores of the Danube River. And this people had come from Iraq a few hundred years before, and they had perfected this method of wheat agriculture. Okay. They, they figured out how to make it work with a coalition of species, especially cattle and beef, or I'm sorry, cattle and wheat. Those two things were the, the centerpiece of that agriculture. Those people were very near the Caucasus Mountains, hence they took the name Caucasians. Okay. In a matter of about 300 years, they took over Europe. That's lightning speed, but we know it happened that fast, about 300 years. It was a blitzkrieg. We call them the LBK people for the type of pottery they had. That's how we trace their, their advance. 300 years is longer, or I'm sorry, shorter than it took us white people, Caucasians, again, to take this continent, and it happened 6,000 years ago. Once the Caucasians had taken Europe and they wiped out an indigenous culture of hunter-gatherers that was already there, we called them Cro-Magnon people. The remnants of Cro-Magnon people to this day are the Basque people in, in Spain. 
That's all that's left of Cro-Magnon. The rest of them are Caucasians, every single one of them. They kind of stopped when they got to the UK and grew wheat and beef for a while and worked on some transportation issues. And when they settled those, they colonized the New World. And today, if we look at the temperate grasslands of the world, the temperate grasslands are in Europe, that band where the Caucasians originally began. They're also in North America. There's a patch in South America. There's Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. That represents the, the complete stock of temperate grasslands in the world, all of the places that wheat will grow. Wheat only grows in temperate grasslands. Those are the places of Caucasians to this day. In every single one of them, you will encounter nothing but Caucasian names, or nothing but there are a few surviving native cultures. They're the places of wheat and beef, and now corn, because we added that to the sweet when we took over North America. But they're also the places of agriculture. 90% of the world's agricultural exports come from those places, those places alone. That sort of expansion was necessary, not because those particular people were bellicose, more than any other group they were. That's not why. It was necessary because their population was growing and they were constantly depleting soil. And they had to move on and on and on and always grab new land, plow up new land. What I'm making, what I'm trying to say here is that agriculture in general, and wheat in particular, was the engine of imperialism that European imperialism, the Western world, was driven by its need for new farmlands constantly. Obviously, this strategy has its limits. Okay. That sooner or later, you're gonna run out of land to colonize. And in fact, that did happen. It happened in about 1960. Okay. So within our lifetimes. We ran out of new land to plow, but we didn't run out of people to feed. So the question was, how did we go beyond that? Because almost all of the gain that has come since 1960 has been on the same land base that was forever there. We did it by increasing yield. Okay? And if we look at the yield per acre, the number of bushels of wheat you get per acre, that has been unchanged for all of that 6,000 years up until my grandfather's time. Okay, about 1940, 50 in there someplace, when we started seeing yields go up. It was the Green Revolution. That's what we call that. Okay, but it, it was much broader than what we know as the Green Revolution. But basically what happened is we tricked plants. This plant, and a little bit of technology helped us. Make, we made them shorter. Okay. Forget about all the complicated explanations for the Green Revolution. All we did was make plants short. That allowed us to do a couple of things, but mostly you created an architecture in the plant that wouldn't tip over. So you could ramp up the fertilizer and ramp up the water and increase yield. That's what happened. As a result, population since 1960 has doubled. We went from 3 billion to 6 billion people in my lifetime. We're able to feed them, essentially. There is enough food on the planet for most of those people to this day. We have tripled the use of nitrogen fertilizers in that period. Pesticides came into play at the beginning of this period, and it was something like a tenfold increase in pesticides. Um, we just started to deplete irrigation water, all those things that we associate with industrial agriculture. We know at this point, we know for a fact that this kind of agriculture is not sustainable. It cannot go on. Okay. We've run out of irrigation water. It's in China a couple years ago, and the Chinese are finally worried about water quality. The Chinese are really reticent to talk about things like pollution as they grow economically. They're worried about water pollution because their irrigation water is killing their rice crop. So foully is their water polluted. That's the state of the world. As this sort of agriculture was growing and becoming dependent on this new strategy of not taking over new land but colonizing oil wells instead, because most of this stuff comes from energy, that we have to fuel the tractors to create that disturbance to this day, 
and most nitrogen fertilizer is, is, comes from um, natural gas. So it's an energy conversion. It was also becoming capital intensive and becoming efficient. And the word that scares me more than any other on the planet, I think, is efficiency. And because of that, the very trend that we had seen in the United States, a decreasing number of people on farms, and we now have less than 1% of our population living on farms, and certainly less than that making a living on farms, that trend started to spread through the developing world as we export at this point of agriculture. So in places like Asia, we started the trend toward megacities because as people were thrown off the land, they were forced into cities. And so um, I, I once had this explained to me by a man from Hyderabad, India. Okay? And he was slightly younger than I am. Hyderabad, when he was born, was a city of 300,000 people. That's roughly the size of, I think, Colorado Springs today. 300,000, relatively minor city. Within the next few years, within this decade, Hyderabad will have 10 million people. It will be a megacity. The number of megacities in Asia will double within the next 10 years. It is what has made that end of the world untenable. And while I said that we have enough food to feed all the people on the world, that's the good news. The bad news is the people of the world no longer have enough money to buy it. So we have roughly 2 billion people, a third of the human population, that lives on less than $750 a year. Okay. We have an equal number. Now, that's the very richest third of the population. We have an equal number, or the very poorest, the very richest, that's us, and that's Europeans, that's Japan. You know what the dividing line is to that richest third of the world's population? It's $7,500 a year. Okay. What we would consider the poverty level in the United States makes anybody, even the most poor person in the United States, among the world's richest. About 1.2 billion of those 2 billion people, the very poorest, live on less than a dollar a day. They are malnourished in any, by any measure. We have, for instance, besides the normal things you would think of starvation, and that's true throughout Africa, it's true in Asia, we have things like a million cases of blindness a year in children because of vitamin A deficiency. And we talk about development, but you say, well, how are we going to develop a place where the kids are all blind? What chance do they have? I lay out a fairly grim case here for a reason, because we are at a crossroads. These things are not sustainable, both in the environmental damage, but the damage to humanity. And that if we are to address these problems, we must rethink agriculture, what lies at the base of all of this. This has been a long time coming, 10,000 years, but what created it was agriculture. My title is that science must reinvent agriculture, and I mean that. And I can also report that science now does have the tools to reinvent agriculture. I couldn't have said that 10 years ago. Let me build this case from a personal experience of mine, but try to generalize it. In the personal level, or, or what I know, what I saw up close, was a project I did with the Rockefeller Foundation. This is kind of interesting that the Rockefeller Foundation would be involved in this because the Green Revolution itself, what I'm citing is creating all these problems in the 1940s, was solely the creation of the Rockefeller Foundation. Okay. It's Rockefeller Foundation money, and it was spent at the urging of Henry Wallace, who was Franklin Roosevelt's vice president and one of the most progressive people ever in public office in the United States. And he saw people starving to death, and he urged Rockefeller to spend the money on the Green Revolution, and they did. And they did things like send Norman Borlaug to Mexico, and Norman Borlaug made plants short. That's what started that. The people at the Rockefeller Foundation are as aware of these problems I've cited as anyone. They know there are problems. They admit that. They understand that their money created some of the inequities. They're going to the world because technology is never neutral. 
And when you throw technology out there, it always creates disruptions, and sometimes those dis disruptions harm people. And they knew that. So there was a new round of thinking. Okay? And this began about 15 years ago. It began in the mid-'80s, so that's 20 years now. Rockefeller did a very systematic examination of the problems. And they simply commissioned scientists from all over the world to write papers and say, what do we do next? How do we revise this? And the scientists told him two things. They said, one, you should work on rice. And it's an interesting thing about rice is it's, it's, first of all, the sustenance of the poorest people in the world. But if you think about it, rice is that one thing that they can eat directly. Wheat has to be processed, corn has to be processed, ground some way, but rice, you don't have to do that, so it can allow this hand-to-mouth existence. And it turns out that almost no rice is exported in the world. I mean, it's traded back and forth a little bit, but it's not like wheat and corn, that the people who grow it tend to eat it. So they suggested if you intervene in rice, we can help the poorest people. The second thing they said is, you're going to have to tackle these problems with biotechnology. Okay. Rockefeller agreed with that and decided to go into a program, and they ended up spending like $200 million in the last 15 years on various scientific developments. Rockefeller asked me to go around and look at some of these projects in the world. So two years ago, I did a lot of traveling. I was in 13 different countries. I spent a lot of time interviewing scientists and tried to get, develop a picture of where this was all going. It's interesting. Biotechnology 15 years ago meant something quite specific. It meant genetic engineering. And that's the thing we go, Ugh. right? That's what it meant. So Rockefeller said, how can we tinker with genetic engineering in ways to benefit the poor? You know, that was a very narrow question at the time, but it's the only way they knew how to ask it. And they got some answers. And they started, and the answers were pretty discouraging. What they essentially said was, Nobody's ever genetically engineered rice. We're not even sure it can be done. We're not even sure the benefits of it is done. So let's spend a lot of money in basic science. Let's find out if we can do it, and let's find out what the rice genome looks like. It's an interesting set of decisions. But with that decision, they took a flyer. They made a gamble on something called golden rice. There was a fellow named Ingo Patricus who knew about the million cases of blindness a year from vitamin A deficiency. And he says, what can I do with rice to make that go away? Now, it was a flyer because not only did people not know if we could genetically engineer rice, to do this particular trick, you'd have to put in three genes, not one, and line them up in a pathway to create vitamin A, which would make the rice golden. And nobody had ever done anything like that anywhere. Patricus wanted to try, and Rockefeller was willing to bet, so they bet on that project. Fifteen years later, if I'm to look at the entire result of the Rockefeller project, I'd single that one out as a case study because it led to some failures. That's quite interesting. And those failures in general talk about where technology can take us, but also the failure of genetic engineering. So let me trace that one first, then I'll come back to what else happened. The scientific story was kind of interesting with Golden Rice in that Patricus succeeded. Okay? He was able to take a gene from daffodils. That was the source of that because daffodils are yellow and the yellow color is vitamin A. And after about 10 years of trying and a lot of uh, disappointment, they engineered Golden Rice. It's about 94, 95 in there someplace. Golden rice is still not growing in anybody's field. Part of the reason for that was the political objections to genetic engineering. But the biggest reason for that was intellectual property rights. Okay? Uh, I've talked to Patricus personally about this. I sat in his house in Switzerland one day, and he told me this story. And you can imagine scientists taking on this incredible scientific problem and being successful at the end of it and say, God, we're ready to go, we're ready to do this thing, we're ready to plant this in the field. And 10 years later, it's still not in anybody's field. What happened was that as they reached that point, they did an analysis of what's called freedom to operate. What that means is, are there patents on this? 
And Patricia says, no, there can't be patents on this. Nobody's ever done this before. Well, let's do the freedom to operate analysis anyhow. The founder of Golden Rice ran afoul of something like 37 different patents. More interestingly still, I said, well, how do we negotiate with 37 different countries or companies about these patents? You don't have to. All those patents are controlled by two companies, Monsanto and Syngenta. Okay? Every single one of them. Now, in many cases, these are enabling technologies. These are not inventions they patented. They patented tools. Not only that, those, those inventions, those development of those tools were done at public institutions with public money. And Syngenta or Monsanto either went in and bought those patents or bought the companies that bought those patents and the universities sold them to them. And they were playing a monopoly game. They were playing for social control. Rockefeller spent about five years and about $2 million negotiating to, to try to break the deadlock on these patents for a very good reason. Because if they didn't break this deadlock now, then this set of technologies is a non-starter. People at Rockefeller are still optimistic that Golden Rice will hit the field someday. I'm not. And I think more to the point that is that this situation with patents okay, it makes this technology a non-starter. It really doesn't matter what we happen to think about golden rice politically. That genetic engineering, as it was initially conceived, was a tool for social control. And the corporations were quite willing and able and effectively locked up that tool. It is no longer available. And if in the developing world you have to spend $2 million to negotiate a patent deal every time you want a new variety of rice or a new variety of anything for poor people, it is a non-starter. People can't afford it. Let's leave genetic engineering. Because as it turns out, biotechnology is about a lot more than genetic engineering. And nobody thought so at the time. Nobody thought about it that. But Rockefeller also spent some money in basic science. Let's just figure out what rice looks like. Nobody wanted to take on the job at the time. And so um, in about mid-1980s, a politically active woman named Susan McCooch was traveling through South America. And she was looking at the poverty, and she became more politically active. And then she went to, I think, Uruguay and became involved with a bunch of politically active people in Uruguay, and all of them ended up in prison, as usually happens in South America. So Susan said, maybe I better try a different method. And she was not a scientist. In fact, her, her background was in languages. But she said, if there's a future here, this is, it has to be in plant sciences. So she got her master's degree in plant science back in the United States, and she went to Cornell and she tried to get admitted to a PhD program at Cornell. And they wouldn't admit her as a full-time student because she was a young mother. Okay? And so they said, we'll admit you as a provisional PhD student. But since you have a kid or a woman, no, nah, not full-time. Meanwhile, she went into a lab with a fellow named Steve Tanksley. And Rockefeller had approached Tanksley and said, will you map the rice genome? And he says, oh, I guess. So he went to all his grad students and said, you guys, are any of you willing to take this on? And none of his postdocs would. All of his PhD people said, no, this is a loser. There's no money to be made in rice because Monsanto and Syngenta aren't interested in it, and they're paying the six-figure salaries. So this is a career ender. Nobody wants to work on rice. So running out of postdocs, he went to Susan. He said, Susan, will you do this? Yep. She decided to take on the task. And she was succeeded. She succeeded not only in mapping the rice genome, she published in 1988, an unknown to her at the time scoop the Japanese who had been working on it for something like 10 years and had spent several million dollars trying to map the rice genome. It was headline breaking scientific news at the time, but we didn't know how beneficial it was going to be because as it expanded, 
And as the map was published, a wheat geneticist in, in Britain took a look at it. He says, this looks awfully familiar. He'd been trying to map wheat. And he says, there's something striking about this. And he started playing with it, of what he knew about wheat against what we knew about rice. He found out something called syntony. His name is Mike Gale. And he said, you know, when I interviewed him, he said, it, it, I can't understand why it took us so long to figure this out, but it's true. If you take that, that very difficult map of rice that took the Japanese millions of dollars and they failed, and Susan McCooch finally did. If you take that and you wrap wheat around it, it turns out that they kind of fit together like Russian nesting dolls. And you can put corn around that, and it fits. And you can put teff, another grass they eat only in Ethiopia, nobody works on around that, and that fits. And it turns out all the grasses, all the annual grasses, has something conservation of their genes. So if you find a gene in one of them, you found it in all of them. And not only that, if a given plant like corn, which is yellow, has a trick of producing vitamin A, by crossing a wild relative of rice with rice, with domestic, this very strange, off in the corner wild relative, and got to triple the yield that you normally have with rice. She got not only that, she got disease resistance that had never been there before, and pest resistance that had not been there before. That work has gone on, and it's a very simple matter of breeding to cross a wild relative with domestic rice. So we have a tool. We have a tool that's immediately available to the developing world, to the poorest people in the world. We have something more important, something vital in this piece of information. And all of this has come together, synthony, the mapping, now the sequencing of the rice genome, to really expand our basic knowledge. And the basic knowledge goes back to what I was talking about 10,000 years ago. The process of domestication was not change. We didn't alter those genomes so much as we reduced them. We knocked out genes, and we knocked out genes, and we knocked out genes. So in our rush for instance, and we know this is true, it's been going on for thousands of years to make rice nice and uniform and white through breeding, we also took away its color, which did things like anthocyanins, for instance, prevent cancer. So we're learning that those color did things, but they also do things like keep bugs away. And we lost all that wisdom in those wild relatives. That there is in biodiversity, and there is in the wild, resources we didn't realize we had. Shortly after visiting with Susan about these things, I was in Costa Rica, and I went out with some scientists in, in, a, in a biodiversity preserve, and we were looking for wild rice. Now, if her discoveries about wild rice had not happened, then people in Costa Rica wouldn't be out trying to preserve those wild species. But all of a sudden, they had value. We understood that those were there, and those were vitally important to us. But they're also accessible to people in Costa Rica. All of this came together in kind of a suite of technologies. Okay. Genetic engineering is off in the corner. But we have conventional breeding, which has been going on for 10,000 years. We're still doing that. We have techniques called um, uh, tissue culturing. What that means, basically, is that we can make plants grow that ordinarily wouldn't grow. Okay? And, and some of those are relatively simple. But what that allows in the real world are wide crosses. So these wild relatives often wouldn't successfully breed with the domestic varieties. So tissue culturing techniques allowed us to force that breeding. Okay. Now, if you worry about genetic engineering and playing God through genetic engineering, know this, that prior to genetic engineering, there were something like 37 successful crop plants that were the result of interspecific crosses, that is, species, they crossed species. So it's the equivalent of breeding a chimpanzee with a human. Okay? And there were some cases where they crossed genus, wide crosses through tissue culture. But the mapping also did something really important. It gave us genetic markers. So we were able to do DNA fingerprinting 
of all the crop plants. We were able to tag the genes that we were after and do normal breeding, and we know we had those genes in our crop plants. So we're able, with that suite of technologies, to go back into the wild and redo domestication. We can go back and get what we lost. Not only can we do it, we can do it cheaply. We can do it on a level that is completely available to the developing world. Let me give you a concrete example. I was in, Indi in India, near Bangalore. An interesting place, Bangalore. It has, a, it has a thriving economy, unlike most of India. And I worked with a, a, a scientist there named Shashidar, who became interested in drought tolerance. Remember I said we're running out of water? Drought tolerance is hugely important right now. And oddly enough, he went, uh, he was using some of the mainline rices, and rice has been bred, that, rice was the foundation of the Green Revolution. And so there are, there's a series of, of a few breed, or varieties of rice that are grown universally around the world, the one-size-fits-all solution of the Green Revolution. Those are notoriously intolerant of drought. All of them need water, they need irrigation. But there's a branch of rice growing that's been going on for 10,000 years in this little corner called dryland rice. And it turns out it's practiced by the very poorest people in the world because it's dry land, right? And they can't afford the irrigated land. So these people live on the margins on the edge. And this guy had been working for a long time with drought tolerance in the mainline rices and found out he couldn't get anywhere with it. So he finally went out and said, what are you guys growing? to the farmers there. And it turns out that they had something like 200 or 400 different land races of rice in an area about the size of Missoula County. And they had developed those painstakingly over the years. And he says, well, why do you guys grow these things? He says, we develop these, these superior varieties of rice that yield better. And they said, yeah, they yield better when it rains. But it doesn't rain. And in those years, my children would starve. When I grow this, I get a small crop, but I get a crop every year. And not only that, they taste better. We like them. And it turns out they were getting premium in the market. They could sell those in the market for a lot more money than they could sell any other kind of rice. So this scientist looked at all that and he said, huh, why didn't reinvent the wheel? He went back with and did DNA markers for the very genes that allow that drought tolerance. And he was able to breed those and make kind of a super variety for the, local, for the local area. So get some yield increase, get some improvements, but still respect that local knowledge and go back and get it. He was able to do so very cheaply. Let me take you now to Madison, Wisconsin, another example. Um, the loneliest guys in the world are the guys who, who are plant breeders and don't work on corn and wheat and rice. So if you work on something like beets or onions or carrots, right, you are forgotten. You do not exist. And it turns out that in the United States, there is exactly one half of a person working on onions. <laughs> and there's one half of a guy working on beets. And they're the same guy, right? So you didn't <laughs> see half a scientist. And his name's Erwin Goldman. And uh, if you've gone to the market lately at a, a good food store or someplace like that, you've probably seen golden beets, right? And you might have even seen striped beets. Now, you can thank Erwin Goldman for both of those. Now, what they did was find out that there are actually two genes at work that make the red color in beets. Now, when both of those genes are active, then the beet is red. And one of those genes not, gets knocked out, and you can knock them out without genetic engineering. There are easy ways to do it. The beet is gold. Not only that, if you can turn the gene on and off in different growth layers, the bean is striped, or the beet is striped. So you get all of a sudden all this interplay with beets. Uh, why do we care about this? Well, if you are able to do those things, they become more palatable, more interesting to consumers. So people eat more beets. Well, the thing that's causing this red color is called betalin. And betalin, it turns out, is a cancer-fighting agent. It suppresses cancer. So if people eat more beets, and you're able to amp up the betalin in it through breeding, then you can have people ward off cancer. But Goldman himself was also an organic farmer. And Madison is like Missoula. It has an active uh, community uh, relationship with farmers and things like farmers markets, and he's involved in all of that stuff. And he said, you know, 
and right away he went to Bakuchi's work. And I didn't bring Bakuchi up at all. Susan Bakuchi, the person at Cornell who had mapped rice. Why would he care about rice? He's, after all, the half a guy who breeds beets. What he said was, what that taught him was that you can use markers to find things. And there will be wild genes out there that will be incredibly important to you. And you can do so very quickly and very cheaply. And it turns out that there are collections, of, there are gene banks all over the world where we have literally thousands of examples, hundreds of thousands of examples of plants. We never had a way to catalog those. We never had a way to figure out what they we do now. We can go in with genetic markers and we can find those things we're after and breed them in very quickly. Goldman tells me this is incredibly important because before all this came around, the way the university functioned, he had to work on hybrids. He had to work on hybrids because seed companies are interested in hybrids. And universities are working in, interested in working with seed companies because that's who generates the income, right? To pay for the half a beet breeder. But what he's able to do now is go ahead and do that work, but also very cheaply develop different varieties of beets that are called land races. They're not hybrids. Release them to farmers. Farmers can grow them. They can save seed year after year. They don't have to buy seed, and they have the kind of diversity that we need in our diets. All of this is making the case that we have those tools to be diverse and specific and very smart and do so cheaply. And kind of a guerrilla science is developing in biotechnology. So what does all this mean? What does it mean to the poor people of the world, for instance? What does it mean to the fundamental problem with agriculture, catastrophic agriculture, that we have to plow this up every year? So far, not much. But any of you who have followed agriculture probably know about the work of Wes Jackson. Wes is an interesting fellow. And at the end of all this, I went down to see Wes. And he's, Wes, a long time ago, realized these things I'm telling you about catastrophic agriculture. And he said, the way to approach all this is not through these little dinky steps in small technology. He was thinking big. He says, I'm going to reinvent agriculture so it looks like a prairie and that we stop growing annual plants and we stop growing monocultures. And we'll develop a system of four or five plants that mimics the prairie and is there forever and will survive forever. Wes has been out there for about 20 years. And he's gotten, he's made progress. But I went out into Wes's greenhouses with a guy named Stan Cox, who is chief breeder now. He says, Stan, are you using marker-assisted selection? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Are you using embryo rescue techniques? Oh, yes. We have to do wide crosses if we're going to do this. And if you really pin him down, especially Wes himself, and you say, Wes, if it really comes, push comes to shove, will you use genetic engineering? Will you take a gene from someplace else and splice it in to reinvent agriculture? You say, yeah. Yeah, you will, because it's that important. What I'm making here is that we now have assembled this suite of tools, and they have come together very rapidly in five or ten years. That not only are we able to circumvent the problem of genetic engineering, get around that, we are able to reinvent agriculture. The tools are there. The live question is, what does it mean? I don't know. I don't know. It gets back to that subculture issue I was talking about earlier. Our societies are very good at ignoring scientists. And they're very good at ignoring poverty and the fundamental problems in the environment. And it's a live question is whether we're going to be able to go on and use these technologies. One of the smartest people I know and one of the smartest biotechnologists I've ever met is a guy named Richard Jefferson. And he, he has a shop in Cam, uh, called Cambia, C-A-M-B-I-A. -A. And it's a good website if you want to get some more information about this stuff. Uh, he lives in Australia. In Australia because it's close to the rice growing regions of the world, but he can still do first world science. I was talking to him this about him one day, and he's one of these motor mouth guys just nonstop and picks things from here and there and there and there, and it's all technology and it's all brilliant stuff. And I said, Richard, slow down, you know, technology. I mean, you're, you're making the case here that you've got problems, problems. He says, no, he says, I don't believe in technology. 
He says, you know, in the end, this is just something we do because we're able to do it. But he says, you know, if I could just get the kids decent nutrition, you know, when they're, and we were able to do that, we got the technology for that. It'd do a lot more than I'm able to do with technology. If I could just get him, if I could just get them education. He says, how are we going to develop India when fully 60% of the people are, and he was making this up, but I don't think he's far off, are brain wipes. It was his word, brain wipes. He's kind of a blunt guy. What he means by that is they're so malnourished that they're brain damaged. It's true. So how do you develop a country when that's true? And he said he'd trade all the technology in the world if he could just solve those problems. In fact, we have the technology to solve those problems. We simply don't have the will. Well, whether we'll summon the will in the near future is an open question. Or will, or will we simply ignore these problems and become more insular, as we are in the United States? We're able to not look at this in our televisions every day. We can instead spend a week looking at Reagan's funeral, as opposed to the problems of the world. Because that's what we're good at in this country, ignoring the problems in the developing world. I'm not particularly optimistic we will apply this technology. But if we're going to, then we're going to have to have that scientific mindset that keeps asking questions and then questions the answers and keeps doing it on and on again. That's the role of science in society. We'll take questions if anybody wants to talk further about this. Thank you. Back corner. Speak up, please. Yeah, the, qu the question was, um, given these technologies, I mean, how do we still affect the problem that the, the commodity industry, and that's what agriculture is, is a monoculture, and that, that, that it has a lot of inertia and is going to stay a monoculture? And I, the, part of the answer to that is that these technologies are so light on their feet, and, so, uh, and they have an ability to be applied in a number of different directions very cheaply, that it kind of paves the way for guerrilla warfare. So we are able to work outside the mainstream, and we're able to work in public interest science. And all these developments I'm talking about were done by public sector scientists working around the world. And they're an endangered species in the US, but they're a big deal around the world. So that's part of the answer is these, the people who are developing the technologies are very conscious of the commodity blanket and the one-size-fits-all solution, and they're deliberately trying to undermine it. Richard Jefferson, for instance, talks about how he can undermine the social control of Syngenta and Monsanto. He calls them moral lepers, literally. That's part of it. The other part of it is the growing move of consumers to subvert that system. Okay. So the fastest growing segment of agriculture in the United States is organic agriculture. Now, bear in mind that we're spending $20 billion a year on subsidies of corn and wheat. And that's essentially where all our subsidy goes in this country. And despite all that, all the government investment, that sector's not growing. What is growing is organic agriculture. In Europe, organic agriculture is approaching about 30% of the market, or about 10% in the United States. So with the market driving that, and at the same time, people like Erwin Goldman are out there being conscious of how to release those varieties and how to give the, the people who are trying to subvert that system the technology they need. I think we can make some headway. It's, as I said, an open question if it's, we're going to be able to subvert it completely. Yeah, um, uh, the question was, um, 
the, the technologies I'm talking about have, have not supplanted genetic engineering. In other words, the, the, the big companies are still working on genetic engineering. What's that going to mean? I think that was the question. Um, first of all, genetic engineering, and I'm going to say something completely heretical here, genetic engineering is not a bad thing necessarily. Let me give you a case. Um, BT rice, and you're all familiar with BT technology. In other words, they put uh, a bacteria gene into various grain plants so they secrete a, a, an organic insecticide. BT rice was released in China uh, about five years ago. It exploded in, in, in acceptance there in China. And the same in India where BT cotton was released by farmers themselves, the bootleg variety. So in that five years, China reduced its pesticide consumption on its, uh, uh, not rice, I'm sorry, cotton, on its cotton crop by 70%. It's not trivial, okay? Cotton crops are filthy. And when the Chinese would spray their cotton crop, they would literally have a body count. People would die that day. It was not long-term exposure. People died that day. So if you can do anything to decrease that, then it's probably worth doing. But um, those technologies are, and, and the business model is driving them. And the reason that Monsanto and Syngenta are so committed to those things is because they invested 10 years of research and development in them, and they're going to try to milk it for all it's worth. So you're going to see those things survive a little bit longer. But a funny thing, I just wrote some of this in a, in a piece that's in Wired magazine this last month, and I hope no one saw it because it was terrible. <laughs> Why, I'll never work for Wired again. But at any rate, I got an email right away from a guy at Syngenta, a breeder at Syngenta, and he says, yeah, he says, you're right about this. He says, we're using these techniques too. So those techniques are being used within those companies. Um, they don't have the ability to control those because they're not patentable. And so I don't think they'll be able to exert the same control. And I do think you will see genetic engineering fade away, although there, there will be some mainline crops there for it, because, just because of the nature of commodity agriculture. Um, I mean, I have to ask, best intentions in the 70s kind of started this. And are, isn't there some level of fear in this that we're, if this was all we put into play and get working that we're, we're going to see something else then become affected in 30 years, 50 years, that we obviously wouldn't know now. I mean, every time we play with something, and I should say, it, I don't have any statistics back that up, but oftentimes you hear things when we play with them, we start bringing in other crops, we start bringing in insects or whatever to fix the situation, we end up causing other issues. Is there, I don't know, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, the question was, um, Will there be problems from this set of technologies the same way the last set of technologies created problems from 40 years ago? Without a doubt. Without a doubt, there'll be problems from the technology is never neutral. It always creates dislocations. Our best ideas harm people. These will too. The thing is, is it preferable to the status quo? And status quo is not sustainable in any way. So why are these preferable? For one thing, they get at the very root of the problem. And we're starting to talk in terms of not how we put a Band-Aid on agriculture, but how we reinvent agriculture. That gives me some cause for hope. Beyond that, these are diverse. So we're not going to see a one-size-fits-all solution. It's being deliberately um, pursued otherwise. So because of that diversity, if there are problems, they won't be global problems, as they are now. There'll be problems in local experiments, and if we network properly and keep an eye on what each other is doing, we'll see those things coming and be able to correct them in some ways. We'll say, no, we solved it this way in Costa Rica, and we solved it this way in Vietnam, and this would actually work better so the guys in Vietnam will get the solution out of the guys in Costa Rica and do it. So there's that, that ability to do those things. It won't be tied to a business model, so you won't have corporations hanging on to those technologies long past their usefulness. Uh, so there are a bunch of things that build in that I think make this better and some of the things self-correcting. But that's not going to say it won't be problem-free. There will be problems. Absolutely. Yes? If, uh, if agriculture is the engine of human population explosion, how is this 
That's a, that's a really good question, okay? And the question was, if agriculture is the engine of population growth, how is reinventing agriculture going to change anything? The reason for the population explosion of the last 40 years, since 1960, is poverty. Okay? We know that the population grows most radically in the poorest people on earth. They have the most children. So that suggests that we need to intervene there. It also suggests some specific strategies. One is education of women. Um, we, we know that as soon as you start educating women, um, that the birth rate goes down very radically. And we know that if you increase their income of the poorest people just slightly, you don't have to increase it a lot, 10, 15, 20%, the birth rate goes down because of that education factor. All of that suggests strategies where we can intervene, not in that blanket, broad, commodity agricultural approach, which says more food will solve the problem. It won't. But in ways that will enhance the income of the poorest people. And the poorest people, most, a lot of them live on the land. So we can go to the rural poor, and we, we have pretty good strategies for making their lives better and, and reducing their birth rate. The problem is the urban poor. And we're in a bind there. Because, as I said, a lot of people are being thrown off the land. They no longer have the resources I'm talking about. They live in the worst slums on the planet. And our choice is to feed them in the cheapest way we can, which is grain, it turns out, give them their 1,200 calories of grain gruel every day, or to let them die. And there's probably going to be some of both of that happening with the, with the, with the urban poor. That and that's the place where it generates the most violence, they'll be killing each other. But that's the situation we're in now. So the answer to your question is part of it we can solve by reinventing agriculture. Part of it's gonna be really painful. Um, I wonder if you could address uh, what are they doing these studies with the wild rice that grows on the the wild rice that grows where? Yeah, the, the question was, are they grow, doing studies with wild rice that grows on the Flathead Indian Reservation? I'm assuming that's the same wild rice we talk about in like the upper Great Lakes states, like the stuff that grows in Minnesota and so forth. No, because it's not rice. <laughs> that's the answer to that. It's a different, it's a different genus. And all the, 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 the rices are, I should know this off the top of my head, but all the rices around the world are, are, are they're unrelated. We just call them rice because they look like that, and there's very little done. Um, they're also um, wild in the, in, in the purest sense of the word. Now, remember I said that we could tell the domestication by evidence on the plants? That evidence was shattering that um, uh, plants, when they grow in the wild, are evolved to shed their seed, drop it on the ground, but domestic plants are bred to hold on to their seed. And so that shattering crosses that line, which makes it kind of interesting as a food crop. That's why they harvest it the way they do. They go bang on it and the rice drops. And you had a question. Uh, would you comment further on the little aside you said about the reason, one of the reasons we're in Afghanistan is Iraq, because um, there's a lot of people who are living in the desert. Is that part of it? Yeah, yeah. The question was, um, I said one of the reasons that we're in Iraq uh, is because of the devastations of, the, of those countries, and in Afghanistan. Um, and I don't think that's completely coincidental um, because of the depletion of the soil there. In Iraq, it's kind of interesting. It's irrigation and salinization that's caused the depletion. And it's one of the oldest irrigated societies. I mean, we remember the stories from grade school about talking about the Babylonians and hanging gardens and hydroponics. That's where it was. And the, when you irrigate land, one of the inescapable things that goes on is that you increase the salt content on the land because the water evaporates, but the minerals stay behind. And 70% of Iraq's land is sal so salinized it won't grow crops. Um, the same is true in Afghanistan. It's been a wheat culture for a very long time, but also the domestication of some other interesting mainline crops like apples, stuff like that. Um, those oldest farming societies are depleted. And if we, uh, there's been a lot of research done on it, the way civilization moves and how it moved across Europe, for instance. The, the fall, the collapse of empires in order, the Greeks, the Romans, the Spanish, the British. In all of those cases, it was 
That was following the spread of agriculture. So we can almost draw a line and we can say, you know, here are the oldest societies. They fell apart because they started farming first. And those lines are there and, you know, we can look at our society and watch farming fall apart in places like the Oglala Aquifer, which we're now depleting, or something like 60% of our, 16% of our grain comes from. So that depletion is an inevitable part of it. What's up the ante in Iraq is, is our dependence of, our food's dependence on hydrocarbons. I mean, really, we're talking about, we're not talking just about gasoline for our SUVs. We're talking about our food. Because it takes something like 10 calories of hydrocarbon energy to grow a calorie of food in this country. That's why the poor can't afford it, because they can't afford gasoline. They can't afford food made with gasoline. Okay. And I think some people know that, how dependent we are on energy. It's not just for driving, it's not just for transportation, it is our food, and I think that has up the ante there. the um, argument as if there are only two solutions, the status quo or using science and technology to find a better solution. And I think that there's a number of people, scientists and agricultural researchers, that would argue that um, Western science, hand in hand with technology and the way that it produces and tries to master nature and whatnot, are, are the systems that ultimately have made conventional agriculture unsustainable. And so that if we use those processes to try to implement a more sustainable s system, then it's going to replicate the problems that we have now. And so I'm wondering, what is it about Western science that's changed or that suggests that we're not going to replicate those problems? The question was, um, uh, I, I seem to be making this case, it's either technology or the status quo. And, and it, but there's clear evidence that technology is what created all these problems in the first place. And what is it about science now, or, and, and the term was used Western science, that uh, means that, that, that it's going to avoid those problems? Um, I don't think there's anything about science now that's going to avoid And I won't use the term Western science. All science is Western, essentially. That's one of the things we gave the world besides wheat. Um, but. <coughs> There is being built into that, first of all, and that's why I cited Richard Jefferson, because he doesn't believe science is going to solve the problems, and he's a scientist. And I think there's a growing awareness among the scientists that I've interviewed, that, that sense of humility I talked about earlier. That they got a piece of it, but they don't have all of it. I'm also, I've also talked to Norman Borlaug from a generation ago, you know, the guy who started the whole Green Revolution. If you talk to him and you ask him, will science solve the problems? He said, absolutely, we solved them all 40 years ago, and they remain solved. I mean, he's that blunt about it. He got madder than hell at me when I wrote otherwise. Right? He wrote me this long letter. What I'm saying is that, that, that we, 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 I think we've learned some of those lessons. We haven't learned all of them. But the, the, the very best science today is, 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 it has a sense of humility. It's looking at traditional knowledge. Remember the, 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 the drought tolerant rice in India? Came from those farmers who have been doing it forever and, and that's a way of tapping that traditional knowledge. It's able to do those things. It's diverse and it, it's iterative. In other words, we put a solution out there and we understand that that ain't a solution. That's just the answer we got today. We start questioning the answer almost immediately and go for the next iteration. How do we make it better? How do we, how do we refine this solution? The other thing that's going on, I think, and, and this is almost in its, inf it is in its infancy. Nobody does it well yet, but people are trying to get interdisciplinary. They're finally getting past the tunnel vision, especially the academic tunnel vision that goes on. They've learned the hard way that the solutions they've invented in the ivory towers fall apart as soon as you get in the developing world. And they fall apart for a lot of good reasons, not because we don't need intelligence and education to solve the problems, but because we've channeled our intelligence into disciplines and it stopped us from talking to each other. And there are some self-conscious attempts now to get interdisciplinary. It's especially true at Stanford. I know of a group there that's working constantly on how do, we, how do we start crossing lines to solve these problems. They've made some starts in those directions, and I think that that's, that's a promising direction 
but it's going to take a long time to get past that kind of ossification that we all know occurs in academia. You mentioned the sorts of things that the popular press emphasizes. I wonder if you could give us a little more perspective on, on getting the ideas that you have out into a broader audience. I mean, I could be wrong on this, but I do know the fact that even amongst very well-educated, well-informed people, there's not a lot of understanding of the sorts of issues that you're talking about. Yeah, the question was, how do we get these ideas and understanding of these problems out into a broader audience. Um, I don't think you do and I don't think it's necessary. That in many cases the technology will drive this awareness. If there's power in a solution that somebody comes up with, that'll drive awareness eventually. I mean, it's not that I wouldn't like to see public awareness of these issues and people spending money. I'd love to see the farm subsidy system killed tomorrow. I mean, if I were king in the United States, and I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon, but I'm staying by my phone. If that were to happen, I would stop the farm subsidy system tomorrow, and I'd redirect that money toward um, things like uh, sustainable ag in the U.S. and grass-fed beef, for instance, those kinds of and, and research. So public policy does have something to play on this, but public policy, I think, is now so dysfunctional that it'll only be rebuilt to the degree we're able to rebuild the technology that supports it. And that's nothing new. I mean, when I talked about the big houses arising with domestication, so did government. Yeah. And that's when we started doing things like letting priests predict when the sun would rise and when the eclipse would occur so everybody would build canals. Because agriculture became a system of ordering slave labor and it hasn't changed one little bit. So government is going to be resistant to these. The public will be resistant to these because we are particularly good at ignoring the problems in the developing world, and that's where it is. I would love to get these solutions out. They're not going to get out. The popular press is not going to pick these issues up. And so we're just going to have to work as a subculture and make things happen. I'm just wondering um, if you can sort of define the the technical methods that you refer to, you refer to tissue culturing techniques and marker system selection. Is there anything else you didn't refer to that's important to know about? Yeah, uh, the question was, can I do, do a better job of defining the techniques? Tissue culturing, marker assisted selection, and things like white crosses, which is not really a technique. And the, the broader issue there is something called functional genomics. Okay. Tissue culturing is simply the ability to grow a full plant from a single cell. So you heard about stem cell research in humans, for instance, why that's controversial. That's a form of tissue culturing. So in, in, in the normal course of events, you know, a sperm and an egg unite, and that's what creates the cell, and that grows. But in tissue culturing, what you do is take a cell from any place, you know, take it out of a leaf or something like that, and cause that to grow into a complete plant. And then there are some variations on the theme that occur in plant breeding. Um, for instance, some of the resistance to plant breeding across species is, is physical. In other words, there's a barrier that particular sperm is too large to enter an opening or something like that. So they get around that mechanically in some way. And so that's part of that. Marker-assisted selection is simply using information, markers. Markers are kind of interesting. The genome is just a, a big, long string of DNA. And you kind of get a view of the double helix. All they do is grind that up literally in blenders and, and, and smash that up and put it on slides and look at it. But a marker is something that sticks to a certain portion of that, a dye, essentially, that you can see. Okay? And, and there are ways of sorting that out. It's not you don't see it directly. You have to put it in a centrifuge and stuff like that. But different markers stick to different reasons. And if you grow a plant and, then you get a mar and it has a certain trait, Say it's red, <coughs> as opposed to everybody, all the other in the species which happen to be green. And you get a marker that varies in that plant from the other species. You have a marker for that gene. It doesn't necessarily mean you found the gene. At all that means is you found a spot where that marker will stick close to that gene. Okay? Those markers are used in a very complicated process to put together maps. But you can, they're used in breeding. 
Um, and normally, if you want, if when you breed two plants together, you don't know you got the trait you're after. Um, and so you would grow that out through like 10 generations to figure out if you, A, you got the trait, and B, it's stable. In other words, it's not going to disappear. With markers, they simply go in and they, they verify that trait's there with the marker, and so that cuts 10 years off the process, makes things cheaper. But it, it's, it's ways of DNA fingerprinting to look for the traits you're after. Genomics is just basic knowledge, and it it's kind of builds on those markers to enhance, refine our picture of the genome. It's particularly geared toward functional genomics. So can we relate gene to function? Can we find a gene and know that it does this thing in a plant? And the earlier thinking, especially the thinking behind genetic engineering was, you know, there's this kind of lockstep digital thing going on, gene trait, right? Turns out that's not true. That's true for some traits. There are single gene traits, but a lot of genes have many different, or a lot of traits have many different genes driving them. It takes like five or 10 genes. And then there are switches on genes that don't look like genes, but they turn genes on and off. So for instance, there's speculation that golden rice, that rice has the gene for making vitamin A, naturally. It's just not turned on. So there are ways that we can switch it on if we understand that whole system. All this is developing to something pretty interesting, which is, is a fundamental revision of the way we look at genomics, which is that kind of digital model. And it is digital. You know, the computer code is binary. It's all ones and zeros. Well, the genome is four units, quaternary, right? A's, C's, T's, and H's instead of ones and zeros. And it was always assumed that we would have that lockstep linkage between genes that we could read and traits. Digital. Turns out it's not true. It's much, much squishier to the point that people are starting to now think in terms of analog. That gene expression is far more complicated than we ever thought it was. And that, in fact, some of this was done in, in, in Teosinte, which is a wild relative or the wild predecessor of corn. And a scientist at the University of Wisconsin at Madison found the gene that controlled the difference between teosinte and corn. So he found the gene that domesticated corn. He sequenced that gene and he found that it was exactly the same sequence. The gene was identical in both of them, but it was creating all that difference. What they're going to work on, or what they're going to fund. I mean, they decided to look at functional genomics as opposed to, say, trying to develop some basic understanding in soil microbiology. Right. Or what social context by maybe going and asking somebody in Bangladesh what they think versus asking somebody in Wisconsin. What kind of process? I mean, they've been driving a lot of this. How do they do it? Yeah, the, the question was the process the foundations go through to drive public science. How do they decide what they're going to work on? They do not have enough money to work on everything. And, and so they, they try to go how, how they're going to spend their money. And I've watched this happen now on two different foundations, Rockefeller, and there's also a foundation called McKnight, which is the 3M money in, in Minneapolis. They've spent $50 million in this area in the last five or so years. What both have done is first it's iterative process. They, they take a look at what's already been done. Then they generally have hired a bunch of consultants. In McKnight's case, they hired 11 scientists to oversee the, the, the grant making process. And in both cases, they did something they kind of looked globally. They said, where's the biggest need? Where can we get bang for the buck? Where can we leverage our money? In other words, if we spend some money here, there's, there'll be likely more money spent behind it. Um, where are the gaps in knowledge? Where's the greatest need? And finally, in this last iteration, they're starting to ask, how do we affect the world's poorest people? So a generation ago, they'd say just, how do we increase the yield? Now it's, no, how do we make people's lives better, the poorest people, okay. Quit, and, and do technology to do that. Um, so the answer to that is not clear. I mean, there is a science to giving away money. Rockefeller has been at it since roughly 1900. A very interesting, they were the first foundation. Nobody ever thought of this before. 
And Rockefeller did things like fund Einstein, right? So there's still a grant application. They did the University of Chicago. Um, uh, all of public science really flowed out of Rockefeller money. That's not too strong of a statement. It's really interesting how that happened. And as a process of giving away money, they screwed up enough that they finally came to understand better ways of doing it. But it ain't perfect. And they started, oddly enough, in the American South. With, with this whole business. The American South in the 1930s was looked at the same way the developing world is now. And they began there as a public health issue, moved over to agriculture because they found out it was more important, and then expanded that through the world. I guess the short answer is it's an iterative process, imperfect, but they do it like you do all of science. You, you do something, and then you go ask another question. I'm going to take one more question. I'm going to get folks out of here. They probably want to go over and see if Reagan's still dead. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that humans could be understood to have been domesticated by plants. Could you explain briefly? I know you said you don't want to Yeah, I, I made the statement early on that humans were domesticated by plants. Or, or what I really said was, the question was, could I explain more fully that? And that's a jarring concept. But what I really said was it makes as much sense to say humans were domesticated by plants, as vice versa, plants domesticated humans. What I mean by that is if we go look at the evidence of domestication in our mainline crop plants, I told you about those crop plants crossing a line where they were different. Their body, that their shape, their morphology was different and we could have the evidence of domestication. Well, it turns out you can do the same thing in humans. Okay? So there's clear evidence in human skeletal remains when we cross the line from domestication. And there's been a lot of work done on this comparing hunter-gatherers in the same region at the same time to farming people. How their skeletons look different. Generally, the farming people were shorter. They never got very tall, right? That's because they were, more, they were malnourished, more malnourished than the, the hunter-gatherers. They were disease-ridden. They have things like tooth decay, tooth decay is a strictly result of grain because of the sugars in it. They had a lot of diseases that hunter-gatherers didn't have. And part of that's proximity, they all lived together. Part of it is they worked very hard. So um, there's evidence um, 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 in women's skeletons that's been gathered that their pelvis is misformed and their back, lower backs misformed in a certain way and it took forever to figure that out but they finally figured it out that w most women at the time those skeletons spent all their time grinding grain in a mortar and pestle. And this rocking back and forth deformed their body so it was differently shaped. All of those things are kind of Lamarckian. In other words, what I'm saying here is that they're acquired traits and they really don't affect the genome. And the true test of domestication is, did we change the genome? Was there selection pressure exerted on humans by domestication that changed our genome? And it turns out we can meet that test as well. So we have, first, for instance, lactose intolerance. Lactose intolerance is something that's a, it's considered a disease, but it's simply a, a genetic condition of people who don't have a long agricultural history. Then in milk, right? So that living around milk. But there are a bunch of things like um, sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is, actually confers resistance to malaria. And so it's not really a disease, it's a condition that's actually a benefit to people who live in malarial areas. Well, it turns out that Africa developed malaria at the same time developed farming because they cleared vast areas and had standing pools of water. So the mosquitoes suddenly exploded and malaria came out of that. There's all these things that go on with that, but certainly our behavior changed radically. And the case I'm making here is that, that there was actually a co-evolution. And that's really what domestication is all about. Their selection pressure existed, uh, was exerted by one species on another that changed both species. And as a result, we formed a coalition of species. And I've mentioned wheat and beef, that's certainly a part of it. Humans are a part of it. Weeds are a part of it. That all our domestics that we fight today are part of agriculture and they, they, they arose because of the disturbance. Weeds are a huge part of it. Things like Norway rats are a part of it because they thrived on agriculture. Uh, the disease organisms, things like um, uh, chicken pops, 
came from domestic animals. And if we look at this coalition, we can tell who belongs in it and who doesn't just by who is increasing on the planet. The increasers versus the, de the decreasers. And that's the coalition that co-evolved with that. Humans weren't dri driving the process, they were simply a part of it. And that's why domestication, it makes as much sense to say we were domesticated by this process as well. Certainly hunter-gatherers said that. None of them went willingly into farming, right? They took a look at those guys off doing all the plowing and they said, nonsense, we're not gonna do that. So we had to kill them, right? And we were the domesticated ones. And that's true around the planet. Thank you.